All right, okay, okay. Look, y'all look like you survived the snowpocalypse. Congratulations. I am so proud of you all. I know there's a little sarcasm in that tone, um, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it goes around here a lot uh, with the snow. But listen, I think Michael already mentioned it, but clearly we're doing something different today. I'm really excited about this uh, because we don't get to do this often, but we are, we are breaking our fast together. We've been in a week of prayer and fasting as a church. And what we did was, I mean, I know people were joining us however they could. We, we didn't tell them how to fast. We just said, you know, you decide, you and God, y'all work that out. Uh, but we did ask everyone to pray. And we were going through specific teachings every day, like online. Uh, a lot of us gathered here, uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, 6 a.m. in the morning every day. And uh, thank you for those who could make it. It was, it was, it was really good. And, uh, but we around the state, all of our campuses, uh, 17 of us and a digital campus, we were all thinking of the same thing, praying about the same things. felt really good. And uh, so we, uh, we're coming out of that fasting time together, and we're going to take communion. This is what we love doing. Every year we do this. And so we come out of the week of fasting, and we break bread together. Come on, communion. If some of y'all were doing a real fast, and this is your first breaking of communion, you're going to want to grab a bunch of those elements, Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're going to do that in a moment. But uh, let me show you a verse, and I'm going to introduce these folks here that are up here with me in a moment. Uh, but there's a verse that I talked about going into the week quite a bit. It's Hebrews 11:6, and it says this, it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith in Him. Because anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists. That's kind of self-explanatory, <laughs> Right? That's for us Cajuns in here, right? So you got that part. But you also have to believe something else. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. That's what this week has been about. As a church family, sincerely seeking God's face. And uh, so we're going to hear from some of our people who did that. And, uh, oh, by the way, I've asked more people than we had chairs. So we have this thing in two waves. This is wave one. Uh, this is them. And uh, here's what I asked them to do. I asked them to share with all of you guys, what is it that God's been speaking to you about this week? And uh, what is it you plan to do about that? And so uh, I thought it would inspire, inspire you guys. I know I could ask many of you to do the same things. And uh, you would have a story to tell because God's been doing this. So, by the way, do you all know that it is very powerful in your own life to tell what God has said or done in your life? Very, very powerful. So, uh, we had uh, initially in the first service, we had the Coonerts, Joel and Alicia was with us earlier, but uh, she decided to bow out after she heard what he had to say in the first service. So um, that is totally not true. And I'll go ahead and rectify that wrong right now. She, they actually are taking care of some neighbors that, uh, that needed some help. And Alicia went over there to help them. And uh, so uh, isn't that great that, that she would be the one that would do that, you know? And uh, so uh, Joel and Alicia, you will see them many times in our foyer, greeting you as you come in. They're also involved in our life group leadership directional team. And uh, anyway, I, I just want to turn it over to Joel. Tell us what, what the Lord has been talking to you and Alicia about this week. Yeah, thanks, Pastor James. And, and by the way, this isn't part of the script, but I just want to tell you from our hearts, we appreciate how you and Kamani uh, just pastor us. You know, and I'm sure everybody out there agrees. So, uh, Joel, thanks for saying that's not part of the script. <laughs> Because that, I did not give you that. Thank <laughs> they you. Gave me this thing for a minute. I'm going to use it. <laughs> what, you know, this this week was great, y'all. We we really enjoyed every single moment and getting up in the morning. You know, Michael and I agreed. You know, we're not morning people, but man, it was worth it. We we got up here and we did it, and I, I was so glad. Uh, so and Alicia and I joined just the, the sense of of being in this together. And on the way home or on the way to work. Friday um, after we left here that morning, uh, we were just talking about, you know, so tell me about the week, you know, just kind of sum it up. And we both said at the same time almost that the word was unity that came to our minds. Unity, just, yeah. just that sense of, man, it was powerful. Uh, we were here together with a lot of y'all uh, and, and just the sense of unity with our in our home, she and I, we just felt a, a stronger sense of bond and unity too yeah. just came around us. And just knowing that, you know, we had so many camps, all of our campuses across the state were doing that same thing 
at the same time was so powerful. And, yes, and so that you, that word unity is what we just really embraced. And, and Alicia uh, mentioned it uh, just too, that, that we underestimate and some, sometimes underutilize just that, that strength of being together, praying together, praying for each other, uh, and just, you know, it's perfect timing going into our life group season two coming up. So we're just going to take it throughout the year and just uh, try to carry that through our life groups this, this spring and throughout the year, just try to carry that throughout the year and just keep that sense, keep that feel of, of unity together. And, and uh, I, you know, one of my favorite movies is, is Braveheart. Uh, I love that ship that, you know, William Wallace, I think is his name. And, and so it's been a while since I've seen it. So forgive me if I'm, if I mess it up, the, the, the quote, but he says something like, I know you're fighters, but don't forget you have the wit of man. And I think he was just trying to say, R. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. No, that's a pirate movie. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad Alicia wasn't here for this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. Was she just was really in the first place. <laughs> but I think what he was saying, you know, you know, don't don't just take the, the sword out there blindly and just start whacking away. You know, it, you know, there's so much ununity and disunity in our country right now, and it's just so it was just so cool to lock, to lock arms with our br- brothers and sisters in arms, just to come together, pray for each other and with each other, and and just to know that you know, y- y'all have our back too, and and we got yours. And, and James is leading us through this, so thanks. Well, well said. I think uh, Alicia would be proud, uh, and uh, so good. And it doesn't surprise me at all that you two were talking about life groups, seeing as how you uh, you work so hard to try to try to create that culture here, and you help us with that a lot. So, um, next up, we have Fallon Stormont, and uh, by the way, she's 11 years old, going on 12 in a couple of weeks, I think, right? Almost 12, and. Uh, Next to her is her dad, Walker. And so, so uh, I would like to say that the Walkers actually uh, help us out. They, they help us lead 412. That's our junior high ministry. And uh, anyway, yep, got a little squad over there, a little squad action. And so I want to hear, this is so cool. I love it. Fallon, uh, the Lord has really spoken to her during this week. And she wrote some thoughts down that he was trying to get across to her. And I would love for you guys to hear this. Just, just enjoy this. Hi everybody, so I'm Fallon Stormont, and something that really stuck out to me this week was probably on Friday when um, someone named Stuart Dalrymple talked um, about forgiveness. And I've heard a lot about forgiveness, but hearing him talk about it made me realize that we cannot forgive by ourselves. We need God to help us to forgive others. And the verse that stuck out to me on the subject was Luke 23, 33 through 34. And that was the verse that Stuart used on Friday. And it talks about Jesus' crucifixion. And it says that while the Romans were crucifying him, Jesus said this prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And to me, that says that even though they were doing something so bad to him, he still prayed for them and forgave them for what they did. And if Jesus can forgive them for crucifying him, then we can forgive those who have wronged us. Amen. And if Jesus can forgive the sins of the entire world, then we can forgive one individual for wronging us. And in Matthew 6, 15, it says, But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And this tells us that unforgiveness is a sin. And it causes us to have a hard and a bitter heart. And it tells us that if we want to be forgiven, then we must first be forgiving to the ones who have wronged us. And the thing about forgiveness is it cannot be earned. So you cannot earn forgiveness. It is something that must be freely given by the person that you have wronged. And the only way you can truly, freely forgive someone is by having the love of Christ in your heart. And I know that this will help me forgive others because I know I can always count on Christ to be there for me and help me to forgive when it is hard for me to. Come on, girl. I'm just going to fan the flame over here a little bit, all right? Because, man, dude, fire, man. I'm telling you right now. Hey, Walker, listen, as a dad, I just got to ask you this. What is it like as a parent to, to see your child go for God? 
like like Fallon has done in this last week, and and actually and actually see that God is speaking to her. What does that feel like? Oh man, that's <laughs> a lot of emotions. It's uh, all the best emotions at once. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we're proud of Fallon for seeking after God, and you know she's she's not only honoring us, she's honoring God by seeking after Him, yeah. and we're so proud for that. And um, it just brings me a lot of joy and a lot of hope for the rest of her generation. You know, if there's a lot more kids out there like her, and we get to see it every week in 412. Yep. Whenever a kid, you know, whenever they connect with God, that's a beautiful thing. Yes, it and is. it's especially beautiful when it's your own kid. Yep. So that's awesome. And uh, it's really encouraging to me and Brittany, too, because it makes us feel like we're doing something right. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, Proverbs 22, 6, it says that if you show your children the right path, then even when they're old, then they will stick with that. That's right. And uh, we put a lot of faith in that. And I just want to say, it's not a two-person job. This isn't something that me and Brittany are able to do on our own. And we're just so blessed to have leaders like James and Chuck and Michael and Morgan and Michaela. It's just, we're so blessed to be here and part of this. Man, well said, well said. Wow. Well, that was awesome. I tell you, I thank, thank you guys for, for sharing all those uh, thoughts with us. And uh, listen, uh, we're going to let them go. We're going to call up shift number two. And so y'all give them a hand. And uh, hey, while, while the other group is coming up, can I go ahead and uh, pray? Pray for what, what these guys were talking about. Just, just receive this. Lord, we just thank you, first of all, for the unity, as, as Joel was talking about, that you've given our church. That's a gift. And Lord, I know we have a part to protect that. We have a part to play. So Lord, I just pray that you would allow us to grow in that even more this year, not just with our church family, but our natural family at our workplace and our schools, God. Show us how to live at peace with all men, God, as much as it depends on us. That is your charge to us. God, I thank you for forgiveness. Lord, thank you for the way that you taught us through Fallon's word that you gave her, God. And Lord, I pray for all of us here that uh, in 2022, it'll be a year where we let people off the hook in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Hey, look, Group B has appeared. This is amazing. See how we do that? Uh, you pray and it happens. Uh, I want to introduce you to some of these folks as well. And uh, first up, we have Beverly Jones. Now, Beverly moved here two and a half years ago, right, from California. Uh, and uh, we, we thought we were happy she came here, but now we are ecstatic. We know we're happy she came here because she, I feel like God just kind of like airdropped her into our church family and she immediately hit the ground running and it started about 15 ministries since. And so I don't know, that's just the way it feels like, but she's a life group leader and uh, many of you guys know her. She loves discipling people in the Lord. And I, I want Beverly to share with us what, uh, what was going on with her and the Lord this week. Yes. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here because we have the opportunity to encourage one another and breathe the breath of lives. And we, we allow God to come and take our twisted and disorderly ways and make them straight. You know, for 30 years I worked as a um, nursing supervisor in a home care agency and I was called the fixer and I would fix everything. Uh, my phone rang constantly and it was always something to fix. And so when I moved here, I found it I drifted somewhere along the way, and I um, became the fixer again. Instead of allowing God to use me, I started just doing stuff. And so um, financially, uh, I, I found I was frivolous. I know Lee's looking, <laughs> Lee's looking at me. I was frivolous, and um, I don't know why I drifted, except I do know that um, the scripture kept coming to my mind, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight paths for your feet. And so I got back to that scripture again and repeating it. And Sunday I had the opportunity to pray with someone who was having some difficulties with her car. And of course, my first thought was, uh, well, then I thought, no, no, no. I'm supposed to be listening. So I stopped, and we prayed, and I listened. And Monday morning, I woke up, and I was still on my mind. 
And I said, Lord, thank you for keeping me from just jumping in there, that I stopped and I listened. But I really need your help here to continue to listen and have the faith to do that. And, oh, I don't know, 15 minutes went by, and I felt really strong. I said, you know, Lord, I am not going to fix this. I'm just going to be part of the believing. And so about 15 minutes went by, and I got a text from the young lady saying that the Lord had made a way for her to get the parts and for someone to fix her car without having to charge her for it. And so we were very excited wow. about that. And that really increased my faith. It increased her faith. Yeah. And and that's really what it's about is letting God be God. Yeah. Let God do his God stuff. I yeah. know I say that a lot. Yeah. If anybody's talked to me for 10 minutes, they've heard me say that. Let God do his God stuff yeah. because he's actually better at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I was really grateful for that. So good. Thank you so much, Beverly. I'm, I'm thankful as well that we have a church full of generous people. There are a lot of generous people like Beverly and others. And, uh, man, that is a great lesson because how many of y'all know we do have a tendency to just jump in and want to fix the people's problems, maybe with our money sometimes, maybe with some other things. But uh, I love that. Let God do his God stuff sometimes. I mean, let him get out there and direct us. And, and uh, I love the fact that other person's faith grew yes. because she gave place for the Spirit of God to do what he needed to do. Love it. Uh, Jason Hall is up next, and uh, many of you know Jason. He's led our usher team uh, for a while. He's led other teams. He's been a life group leader. He graduated from our school of ministry. He spoke his first weekend sermon right here on this stage a few weeks ago. What's up? That was incredible, man. And uh, so anyway, I want to let Jason share about this week as well. I wasn't. I wasn't going to say anything. James had sent a message out to our life group leader, so I knew he was already asking for people to volunteer to speak today. And I had already made up my mind. I was like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. And uh, then during our prayer and fasting on Friday, he, he actually mentioned it again. We were again, we're here six o'clock in the morning, and he said, "Look, you know, we're we're, we're thinking about doing Sunday this way." And the Lord spoke to me right then in that moment. He said, you're, you're speaking Sunday. I was like, what? I was like, no, I wasn't going to. He's like, no, I want you to tell them what I'm doing. And I, I couldn't argue with that. I didn't want to, but I'm going to share what took place this past week. And we, our family has been believing for something for a long time. And Pastor James mentioned last week that we don't pray and we don't fast to force God's hand. But the Bible does tell us that when we fast, we are rewarded. And that's in Matthew. And you mentioned in Hebrews eleven six, it's been our, our, our verse during this Essentials series, that we are rewarded when we seek God. However, the Bible doesn't really specifically state how we're rewarded. Yep. And many of us, including myself, expect that reward to be an affirmative answer to prayer. Yeah. So we go in thinking, hey, we're believing for a miracle. God's going to do this wonderful thing. But what happens when he doesn't? And that was really what our situation was. We were believing for this thing that had, um, if, if, it, if it came to pass, that it was going to save a lot of money. It was going to be a huge time saver. And if it didn't, just the opposite. It was going to be very, uh, could be uh, very costly and uh, had the potential to change different timelines that we have in our, in our family, different schedules. And it was going to affect several people, no doubt about it. And uh, we had been believing for this thing for a while, expecting a miracle. And we've been placing prayer cards on the crosses, you know, during our prayer time. We've had people pray for us and pray over us, like Miss Beverly here. And we were believing. But on Wednesday, we got our answer. And that answer was clear. And it was no. Wednesday night, as you can imagine, it was kind of a somber evening in our home. And, uh, you know, we were dealing with different emotions and, and, and talking about it and trying to figure out, hey, what's the next step? What's our plan? So Thursday morning, we're here. And, uh, you know, this, this, we're only here for 45 minutes. It's really not that big a deal. And um, our prayer time, our individual prayer time is only about 10 minutes or so. And during that prayer and reflection time, God spoke to me clearly. The Holy Spirit reminded me 
of a message that one of our worship pastors spoke at a woman's conference a while back. Her name is Ellen Hutchinson. I don't know. Maybe, 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 or maybe not know her. But she spoke about even if faith. What happens when God doesn't answer the prayer that in the way that you expect him to? In Daniel 3.17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you guys might know this story, when the, with the fiery furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar, they did not bow to the statue. And King Nebuchadnezzar threatened them by throwing them in the fiery furnace, which obviously meant death. And they, he basically told them, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do this again. And they told him no. And they said in verse 17, our God is able to save us from the fiery furnace. Yep. But we might miss out on the next verse, which is verse 18. They follow that up and they say, even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him. We're not going to bow to your idol and your statue. And we're not going to worship other gods. In Job, maybe you know his story. Job, he was stripped of his wealth. His children were killed. I mean, that's heavy right there. He lost everything. And then he has all these health issues. He's got boils all over his body. And in chapter 13, verse 15, he makes the statement to his friends, even if God slays me, I will put my hope in him. Look, we're called to have faith. We're called to trust God and put our hope in him. And we believe Romans 8, 28. And that reads, All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I know we're called, and I know we love God. And let me tell you, one of the gifts of the Spirit is faith. One of the fruits of the Spirit is faith. Another fruit of the Spirit is peace. And in that small 10-minute window on Thursday, my faith was strengthened. And I had so much peace over this situation. I can promise you, I am not disappointed in the no that I received. But I am celebrating because I know that God has something bigger and better planned for our family. So good. So good, Jason. Thank you so much. Alicia wasn't here, so I could use her three minutes, right? Yeah, that's right. No, that's not right. Yeah, three minutes is what I told Jason he had. So clearly he doesn't pay attention to me. So we must move on. <laughs> Next up, we got Brianna Hess here. Uh, Brianna and her husband, Kirk, they also lead life groups for us. And uh, why don't you clue us in on what God's been doing with you guys this week? Hi. Um, I, I remember the uh, teaching that Jason is talking about that Ellen gave, and, and that even if, that's everything. Because yeah. no matter what, even if everything goes wrong, Jesus is enough. Yeah. Enough. Um, and that's irrelevant going into our week of prayer and fasting. Um, prayer and fasting is what changed our lives five or six years ago when we first came here. Um, and every year I look forward to a new season of prayer and fasting. I'm ready to do business with God. I'm ready to go to war with the enemy yep. um, and intercede and, and probably receive some correction and adjustment because I usually need that. Um, so I was excited going into this year. Um, And I was also thinking about something that we've been hearing a lot about recently, which is surrender. And I've been convicted for quite a while that there are areas in my life that are not fully surrendered to God, but I haven't really been able to identify them. um, And God has seemed really, really silent on the subject. So going into prayer and fasting, I I was hopeful to hear something. I'm ready to take care of spiritual business. And I always have a prayer list um, because... That's what we do, you know. We, we have our list. We put it on the cross. We, we talk to God. But this time, I had nothing, not even a word. Um, and that was kind of disconcerting. <laughs> so on Monday, uh, we came to morning prayer, and, and James was teaching, and, and I started a, a little bit of a list going. I'm like, all right, great. By the time I got home, that had fizzled out completely. So I decided to pick up a book that I had been given the day before by none other than Miss Beverly. <laughs> um, she touches so many of us. And I started to read. And as I started to read, God spoke to me so, so clearly. 
And he showed me what I needed to surrender, and he showed me why I hadn't been able to. So what God told me is that I had been desiring the love of my husband more than I was desiring his love. And that really, really hit hard. Because Kirk and I have been in marriage ministry for a number of years, and I know what I'm supposed to do, and I know that God's supposed to be first. But here I was, putting my husband before God. God also showed me that it was the fear of never fully having my husband's love or rejection that was hindering my surrender. But 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline, or sound mind. And 1 John 4.18 says, Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced love. It wasn't until I surrendered my desire for my husband's love to God and let him replace it with his perfect love that God could do his work. So his perfect love cast out my fear of rejection and enabled me to finally surrender my husband to him. And then God changed us both. The very next day, the next day, you guys, the next day, Kirk came home to me and apologized. And he said he'd been really convicted that God, God was telling him he wasn't loving me the way that he was supposed to. Mm. Wow. And I, I am in so, so much awe of how God works yeah. and how much mercy he has. Because it's mercy that makes it so surrender doesn't hurt. Yeah. So now I'm going to continue to pray dangerous prayers without fear and my favorite search me O God and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life Psalm 139 23 and 24 so good thank you Brianna so so good I want to just give a shout out to my man Kirk Brianna's husband because man I'm gonna tell you it takes a man to come and tell his wife that the Lord has convicted me. I am not loving you the way that he wants me to. And so, uh, brother, you got my respect on that, man. And uh, anyway, I'm just so glad you shared that. By the way, Kirk gave his okay for her to talk about this. This is not the first time he's heard this. And uh, we set that straight right, right out, the, out the gate. But hey, can y'all give them one more hand? And as they leave, can we do this? And we're going to prepare ourselves for communion here in a minute. But I just wanted to take time to pray. And uh, would you just lift your hands toward heaven? Just receive this. Lord, I thank you, first of all, for what you've done in these people's lives that we got to hear from. But God, I thank you for what you've done in our, all of our lives this week. And Lord, I, I just pray. I know that we could have had many testimonies here. Hey, right now, would you just thank the Lord for what he did for you this week? Thank him for what he's doing for you this morning even. Just go ahead and thank the Lord that you're alive. Thank him that you're here, that you're a part of something bigger than just your own existence. You're part of the body of Christ. Just thank him that he's given you a place in his kingdom. God, we just are so appreciative of you. That's what today is about, and we do surrender. We love you, oh God, and we thank you so much for all you want to do and all you're going to do. Listen, um, come on, can you say amen through the house? Come on, say amen to God. Yeah. You can give them a hand as well. Before we get to communion, though, I, I wanted to, um, it's hard for them to talk and not have me talk because I'm a pastor, you know. But uh, for real, though, I did want to mention something to you about faith. Everybody say faith. This is what we've been trying to do this week, right? We've been trying to trust God. And, uh, and I've got this great thought in my mind. This is a story, and uh, it's actually in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, it starts in verse 19, but let me give you a little backdrop to it. Jesus is coming off of the Mount of Transfiguration. Maybe you remember that. <laughs> That's awesome and an amazing uh, event by itself, but I don't have time to talk about that. He's coming down off of this experience, and, and a couple of the disciples are with him. But as he comes down, the Bible says there's a crowd of people at the base of the mountain. As typical, <laughs> That's typical for Jesus. Crowds were around him. And uh, there's this man in the crowd. He's a dad. And he comes before Jesus. He runs up to him. The Bible says he kneels down in front of him. 
and he begs Jesus to heal his son. He says, my son is possessed by a demon. This demon is, is hurting his son. And he also says, and I ask your disciples here to, to cast the demon out. They couldn't do it. Interestingly enough, uh, the previous chapter, Jesus had given his disciples the authority and the power to do those kinds of things. But this man's like, they couldn't do it. Please heal my son. Have compassion on him. And so Jesus, after a couple of little uh, straightforward teachings, <laughs> he says, well, he doesn't say much. He just instantly heals the son. He's delivered. He's healed. The demon's gone. It's amazing, okay? And everybody's celebrating. But look at verse 19. It says, afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Now, I like the disciple style. I'd have done it privately too. You know, like, why couldn't we get it done? Okay? Look what he says. You don't have enough faith. Jesus told him that. I'll tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, which is really small, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. What a visual picture. Right? Nothing would be impossible. Now, he's talking about faith in God. And it's interesting to me, and I, and I think, and Jason just mentioned it. Faith, you know, is a gift from God, though. It, it's it's one of the gifts of the Spirit. You can read about it, and uh, and and so so. Here's a question: How can we be responsible for the amount of faith we have? I know y'all think like this all the time as well, like I do. Um, but but here's what I believe is the answer, and I think the Bible backs me up on it. As we seek the Lord, as we get closer to Him, as we obey Him, what happens? We start trusting Him. And then what happens? Our faith in Him grows. Like, that's what it's about, right? Trusting God for seemingly impossible things later on. The more we grow, the Bible says from glory to glory that we mature. We let perseverance run its course. We get faith added to our repertoire of all the things God gives us. Do y'all see what I'm talking about? This is how we do it. Psalm 910 says, those who know your name, talking to God, they're the ones who trust in you. You want to trust in God? Get to know him. For you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. So in 2022, I heard Pastor Rick Bazette say it, we can't, we can't operate with the same amount of faith and trust in God that we did last year. I believe that, look, we have a great church family. Some of you aren't in all the way with us. Get in all the way with us. But we're not stopping at the family level. We're going army level. This is where God's calling us. Being part of the family is great, but I tell you what, you don't want to go to war with your family. <laughs> you can take that two ways. Like you don't want to fight with your family, right? But you do want to know who's beside you in the trenches. And we got to get in the army. We got to get in the place where God has us. But how do we do that? We get to know him better. I believe that through obeying him more and more this year, through getting to know him, obeying him when we don't really understand, trusting him, going through some experiences. Sometimes they're not so great. Am I right? But we trust him and we're okay on the other side. It grows our faith in him. Like, that's nothing but a thing. I've been through that with him before. This is how he trains us. And I believe that's where we're called to. And I believe our faith is growing because of it. Amen.